You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. All right, we're in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're moving right, we're at a good pace right now, guys. We're going to get through this together. We just hold on to each other. We're going to get through this, okay? Ecclesiastes uh, is in the Old Testament. If you have your Bible, it's kind of dead center. This is my Bible. Ecclesiastes 3 is right here. Uh, I don't know if this is exactly the middle of my Bible, but it's really close. If you happen to have the exact Bible that I have, we're on page uh, 554, okay? But I doubt that you do. Ecclesiastes is after the book of Proverbs, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Psalms is massive. It's pretty easy to find there in the middle of your Bible. Ecclesiastes, just a couple of books later. Uh, we're getting to what I consider to be the most popular part of the book of Ecclesiastes, solely because uh, some band in the what 60s or 70s, the Birds, uh, wrote Turn, 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 and just ripped off all of the first half of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and then just added the words Turn, Turn, Turn to it all, right? And so um, it'll be a familiar little section for you. Uh, we're going to go past the Turn, Turn, Turn section uh, to some other parts. If you don't know that song, I don't know what you were doing, right? Because, like, I know that song because of my mama, uh, and some of you should probably know that song as well. Okay, so uh, I don't think they did anything else, the birds. I don't know if they, they, they sang any other song that mattered. Not, not one, but, but that one that they just ripped from Scripture. My wife yesterday, by the way, when I was talking to her about this, she's like, you know, I think they got that from Ecclesiastes. And I said, you know, I think you're right. Um, so we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Uh, the, the issue that we're dealing with today is, is, is what do we do uh, with this life that isn't forever? You know, this life isn't forever. We're reminded of the fact that this life isn't forever uh, on a regular basis. I was talking to Bill Whitmire this morning right before the service, and he has done like five funerals in four weeks or something like that. Had to attend something like five funerals in the last four weeks. What a, what a, uh, what a, what a terrible reminder of how temporary this, this time is that we have here, right? This thing isn't forever uh, that we get here. So what, what, what do we do? What's the purpose? What's the point of all that? Ecclesiastes can be kind of a downer. We're going to find something optimistic today. I promise, Brian, something optimistic today, starting in verse 1 of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It says, For everything there is a season and a time for every manner under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. And then it continues on, right? There's 14 couplets. And basically what the, the author of Ecclesiastes is doing here is telling you there is a time for everything underneath God's purposes. You know, God has appointed time to exist and for us to experience joy and sorrow, life and death, and everything in between, love and hate, something about rocks as well, and forgetting and remembering, right, all, all sorts of things, all manners of things, God has appointed a time for them, and your life is walking through one of those times right now. This may be a season of great joy for you, this may be a season of great sorrow for you, this may be a season of, of gathering in abundance, or this may be a season of, 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 heart, of planting out things and hope that one day you might be able to gather something back in the future. This may be a season of seeking or a season of losing, but, but you are somewhere on this page. As you look through that, you're somewhere on this page because God has appointed in your life every season of your life. Like God is sovereign over time. He is over time. And then we who live underneath this time barrier that God has created live underneath all of those times. So wherever you are today and whatever season of life you're in today, I want you to know that God is over that season in your life. Right? Whether it's a dark season or a bright season, God is there with you. The flow of life leads to both of those. You know, one of the things I say about marriage, I, I love my wife. She is a wonderful woman. Uh, the best decision I made after choosing to fall after Jesus Christ, the best decision I made was at 19 years old locking her down and marrying her. It was the very best decision. She was a, like a, a skyrocketing stock, and I have been on the downhill slide ever since, okay? And so I hitched my star to her at 19 years old. It was the best decision that I ever made. But, but when I talk to people about marriage, when I do premarital counseling, I say no one has brought me greater joy and, and, and love than, than Danielle Higginbotham, but also no one has hurt me 
as seriously. No one has caused me as much pain as Daniel Higginbotham. It's the same thing for her, I guarantee. I hope the joy side is true for her. I know the pain side is true for her as well, that, that I've done that as well. And, you know, we, we live in this life, and your life is going to have both extremes. You will experience that. And sometimes when we're in the midst of the dark season specifically, we forget that, 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 that it's a season and we can get lost inside of it. I want you to know that God has made a time for everything. And wherever you are right now, that is where God has put you. That is where you have wandered into. And God is with you in that season. It is an appointed season for you to be in. And whether it's good or bad, God is with you there. He isn't just there when it's good. He's there when it's bad. Psalm 23, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Right? God is with you no matter where you are, no matter what's going on in your life. You may not feel it. You may feel like he's forsaken you. You may feel like Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he hasn't left you. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't left you alone. He is with you in the dark season. And in the good seasons, it's not because you're awesome and amazing that your life is good right now. God is with you there too. Wherever you are, no matter what's going on in your life, God is with you because he has made a time for everything under the sun. Move down with me to verse 9. It says, what has the worker, uh, what gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time, and also he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And I perceive that there is nothing better for them, that, for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. And also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil. For this is God's gift to man. So the first thing that we see about God is that every season that we're in, uh, God has appointed, right? God has made a time for every season in your life. Everything that you experience, God's made a time. But the second thing that we have here is that God wants you to be enjoying whatever that season is. And that's hard to do sometimes. But wherever you find yourself, to find a way to enjoy yourself in the toil that God has put before you today. Right? And if that's in a struggle, this seems like counterintuitive. Right? The Bible is often counterintuitive. Right? Read the Beatitudes, and that is Doc Shuffield's word for the Beatitudes. Right? They're counterintuitive. Right? Blessed are the right, the weak, right, blessed are the peacemaker, blessed are the poor in spirit, right, it, right? Why, why are those people blessed, why aren't the, the strong and the conquering and the wealthy, right, why aren't they the ones that are blessed, because it looks like they're the ones that's blessed, but, but the Bible constantly is turning things counterintuitively, and so in your life, no matter where you are, I want you to know that that season is a season that God has, has appointed for you, whatever it is, Right? And, and your responsibility, if you want to have the, a life that begins to glorify and honor God, you'll be able to find joy in the midst of that. Uh, the Westminster Catechism uh, asks in the very first question, the very first question, I'm not a Westminster Catechism guy for a variety of reasons, but I like the way it starts. Uh, and it says, you know, what is the chief end of man? It's like, what is man's ultimate objective? What is the goal of man? And it's to, to love God or to enjoy God and love him forever. Right? And part of that is just like in your life right now to find a way to enjoy where God has placed you. And it's easy when it's fun and it's good. When, 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 when the, the life is good and the kids are good and the wife is good and the job is good and the money is good. It's easy to enjoy what God has done. But on the back end of that and those other appointed seasons, it becomes very difficult for us. You know, it's hard when, when, when money is tight to look around and be like, yeah, I'm really loving what God's doing right now. I can see God working right here. This is a wonderful season. You know, my darkest season in ministry, I've shared about it before, I got resigned from a church. You don't fire pastors. This is a dirty little secret. I'm going to give it to you all for free, okay? Rarely does a pastor get fired unless he's a scoundrel. Scoundrel pastors sometimes don't get fired either, which is uh, an abomination to the church. But rarely does a pastor get fired unless they're a scoundrel. So unless I'm uh, living in some sort of abject sin or, or something, I'm probably not going to get fired. Even at this church where I'm beloved. Yes, good. Um, even at this church uh, where, where I'm beloved, um, I, 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 won't, I won't get fired. But, but it could come to a point where I get resigned. And what that means is you get crosswise with enough people, and they come to you and they say, hey, preacher, you need to leave. And you say, well, I don't want to leave. I kind of like it here. And they say, look, you can leave with this money 
or you can leave with nothing, figure it out. And you're like, I guess I want to leave then, right? Because these people are coming to get me. And it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a gross, underbelly, nasty business in the church. But that ex I experienced that in, in a church that I was at. Uh, and, and, and I remember I was just so, so beat up. Because I had been praying to God for, I was at that church for over five years. I have been praying to God for at least three of the years that I was there. God, let me leave this place. I wasn't looking for a job. I just wanted God to say, Matt, you can leave. And then I would have left. I would have found another job and I would have left. But he, never. I remember I was sitting on my bathroom floor pleading with God. God, I hate this place. I do not appreciate where I am. Let me go. And it was always no. You can't go. You can't go. And then all of a sudden, it's like these guys are like, you have to go. And I'm like, this isn't right. I want to, you know, like, like when someone breaks up with you, you didn't really like them anyways. You're like, you can't break up with me. I didn't want to go out with you in the first place, right? That sort of thing. You can't, you can't fire me. I quit. That's kind of what I felt in that moment. I was indignant about that because in that season just led me in this dark place. And it lasted for about a week. Because I was driving, uh, when, I, when I was told I was supposed to resign, weird, um, I, I, I uh, talked to my wife. And then she put my resume everywhere in the world uh, because that's what she does. She's a go-getter. Um, I, I have no idea how she does that, but my resume went to a million different places, I'm sure, immediately, as soon as I told her that. Um, and so she, she gets the resume and fires it out of her. And I go and I talk to my seminary, because I'm still in seminary, I talk to my, my best uh, friend seminary professor. He's my church history professor, a good man, uh, but a seminary professor. And I said, here's what's going on. They want me to quit, uh, and they're going to give me, like, two months severance or something like that. And he says, uh, he says, well, did you do anything wrong? And I said, no, I didn't do anything wrong. He's like, you're not, you know, like, you're not doing any sexual things wrong. You're not stealing any money. These are the things you get fired for, by the way. Like, if you do those things, you get fired. You should get fired, by the way, if you do those things. Um, and I said, no, no, I'm not doing any of that. He's like, you know what? Fight it. You're a Baptist. Fight it. Make them fire you. They won't be able to fire you anyways. Go make them fire you. And I was like, that's really good advice. I don't know if that's right. So I go down and I talk to the dean of the school who's a churchman. He was a pastor for, for 30 years. And I go and I say, this is what uh, Dr. Mullen says I should do. And he says, no, don't do that. <laughs> he says, that's ugly. And, and like, you're never going to be in a good spot. You're never going to have, even if you don't get fired, you're always going to be the guy who should have been fired, right? That's who you're going to be. He says, what are, what, are, what are they offering you? And I said, two months. He said, no, go tell me you need six months. And so I go back and I'm driving back from that. By the way, I went back and I renegotiated for six months left there with a the down payment for the house that I still own in Kingwood. That's called plundering the Egyptians on your way out the door. But um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm leaving, uh, I'm leaving uh, the seminary to drive uh, back to my house. And I'm still kind of, like, my mind is going 100 miles an hour. Because, like, I have, at this time, I have three children. Um, that was a time back then when I only had three children. But I had three children. And, and I lived in a parsonage, and I was getting resigned, for, and I didn't know like, where I was going to live. Like, there was all sorts of things in the air. I didn't know what to do, and I, and, I, and, I, and I said, I don't know what to do right now. And then my phone rings, and it's a random number, and I answer it. It's like, hey, uh, Matt? And I was like, yeah. He's like, this is Woody Woodward, the pastor at Kingwood Bible Church. And I just got your resume, and I was like, yeah. I had no idea, right? No idea. Never. I didn't know anything about Kingwood. I knew where Kingwood was. I didn't know anything about Kingwood Bible Church. I, De I definitely didn't send my resume to him. Yeah, I got your resume. I thought maybe we would like talk to you about it, right? And immediately, God, God used that season. This is what I'm trying to get to, by the way. This is a personal story, but it's where I want to get. Like God took my dark season, and in the midst of that dark season, turned something good out of it. And guys, I want you to know, if you're in a dark season right now, if you're, if you're just walking in a dark season, right, try to find a way to enjoy it because it's temporary. And on the back end, God has something for you. On the back end, there's something that God is doing that you don't see. And I, and I tell this story uh, because I, on Christmas, that next I got fired at Christmas. Best time to get fired. Resigned, officially. Um, at Christmas, the next Christmas, we're looking for stuff to put out all the nativities and tchotchkes that you put in your house. And we couldn't find them because they were literally in every box that we had packed. Right? So, like, the Christmas stuff that was in the living room went in living room boxes, and the Christmas stuff in the kitchen went in kitchen boxes. Because our Christmas stuff was not all together. Danielle was frustrated. And then I just remember, I'd been at that church for like eight months by this point in time, uh, fully on board for eight months. You got a little hiring process there. And uh, I remember I just, I gave Danielle a hug and I said, how great God is that he's put us from there to here. And in eight months, and you know, we're still looking for this stuff from that mess that was made there, but God was there the whole time.
So wherever you are right now, I want you to know God is using that time. And that time is a time that you can enjoy. Your, your chief goal, the chief purpose, the reason you're here on this life, if you ever wonder why you're here on this world, is to find a way to find joy in God and then to point other people back to the God who gives you that joy. Verse uh, 14, it says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which has already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks that which has been driven away. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness even there was wickedness. And I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and every work. And in my heart, with regard to the children, I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to the dust return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes up, uh, upward, and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him. And so now he turns his eyes to the eternity of time. He says in the previous passage that God has put eternity in our hearts, and then he looks at the condition of mankind, and he says, you know what? There are righteous people, or there are wicked people in places of righteousness. This is true, right? There are corrupt people in places where we need righteous people, right? There are unjust judges. Even now, in the United States of America, there are probably unjust judges judges, right? There are probably people who if we knew them and we understood the graft and things that got them to that position, we would not be thrilled for how they achieved that, that, that spot in the, in the world of justice. He sees that justice is, uh, is perverted. Wicked people are where there's justice. Wicked people are where there's supposed to be righteous people. We see that in, in churches, right, where pastors uh, perform wickedly, right? You don't have to go very far to look to find uh, all sorts of scandals around churches and leadership. It is a tragedy, right? And you look at the condition, and we see the nastiness of the world around us, and he says, what good is it because all of us ultimately die? Right? He says, we're just like the beast. We have the breath in us, and the breath is gone. And then we are no more. This life is very, very temporary. And that's, that's something you need to know. This life is not forever. Some of us live like a, a, a YOLO life. Like a, you only live once life, and this life is the only life you're going to have. Joel Osteen says to live your best life today, now. Get the most out of your life right now, because this is the best life you're going to ever have. But the Christian religion teaches us that you have life to come in the future. But that doesn't minimize how important this life is. What you do here matters. The way you live matters. The way you work matters. The way you find joy in God matters. So you should live for God today. Yeah, you guys, God is forever. He says at the beginning, right, right that well, whatever God does lasts forever. Whatever man does is temporary. There's a difference between us and God. God is over time. He is forever. and He's doing eternal works. You are temporary, but God's work lasts forever. And the work of God that lasts forever is the work that you need to understand in your part, first of all. Right? God has made a path for you to have this life forever. This life eternal, this eternal life that, that, that Jesus speaks about when, when talking to Nicodemus, right? To, and, he, and Nicodemus is like, what do I need to do to be saved? And, it, and Jesus says, well, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus says, I don't know how to do that. How do I, I can't get born again. I'm a grown man. I don't know how to get back in there to do that. It doesn't seem possible that I can be born again. And Jesus says, look, if you want to have eternal life, then you need to understand who I am. And Jesus opens up with John 3, 16, right? right? And he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And guys, I want you to know that the key to eternal life, this, this thing that links you to the God that's over time, is belief. What you believe matters. What you believe, it's not what you do that matters. Sometimes we try to make it what we do, that if I do the right things, if I'm good enough, 
if I go to church, if I tithe, right? I mean, I've mentioned the offering boxes twice already. So like, hey, maybe we put a little offering in there. Maybe we'll, 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 we'll go, get closer to God. Maybe we'll be closer to heaven. It's not what you do because Christ has already done it all. You know, when Jesus Christ went to the cross and died on the cross and his arms were outstretched, one of his final words, literally, I believe his final word was, it is finished. It's done. The work that I have set out to do to buy back humanity, the work of the sacrificial death of the Son of God on the cross has been accomplished, and you don't have to do anything because it's done. Right? He did the work. You don't have to do the work. You don't have to get on the treadmill of faith and think, if I just keep running on this treadmill, then maybe I'll be good enough. If I go to church, if I go to Sunday school, if I give, if I serve, if I do this, if I do this. Guys, it's not about ritual obedience. Guys, I love church. I'm a church man. I believe in the power of the church. I believe in the discipleship that the church has uh, for people. It matters that you go to church. It's important that you're a part of a community of faith, but it does not save you. Salvation is found in the name of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus himself says in John 3, 16, it comes through belief. Do you believe in the Son of Man lifted up, crucified? The picture of him lifted up is the same picture from, from the Exodus story when the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness and the snakes come out and are abiding and killing the people. And, and Moses goes to God and says, God, what do I do? And God says, make a snake a bronze servant, put it on a pole, lift it up, and everyone who will look at that will live. And Jesus himself is that final form of the one that we look to and live. You don't have to do it. You just have to have faith. It starts at faith, right? right. Works continue. Your works matter. I'm not going to downplay your works. What you do matters. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that we should find joy in our toil, our service for God, our service for others. But if it doesn't start with faith, you're just on a treadmill that you will never, ever reach the end of. You're a mouse hunting for cheese, and the cheese is on the other side of the wheel, and you won't get to it. Get off the treadmill. Begin with faith. Because, guys, our job as Christians is learn to enjoy God and to enjoy his gifts now. And to do that, we start with faith. We start with believing in Jesus Christ. We start with seeing Jesus for who he is. He is the Lamb of God to come to take away our sins. We begin there. And then we can begin to serve. A lot of people, we get that cart before the horse. and We say, we're going to serve. We're going to work. We're going to do. But you don't have to do. Because Christ is already done. And then your service comes from a different place. Instead of a, a service, because if I don't serve, this is Islam, uh, and I'm not an Islamic scholarship uh, scholar, but kind of Islam in a nutshell, right? If, if you'll do, if you, if you keep the five pillars, if you do, if you give your alms, if you offer your prayers, if you make your, your pilgrimage, if you do these things, then you'll, you'll, you'll be in the right spot. And Christianity has it flipped around, which is if you'll believe these things, your works will follow what you believe. And it's true, right? What you believe, your works follow what you believe. Your works follow what you believe, right? Like, like I believe uh, that, uh, that the sun is going to go down tonight, and so I prepare my mind mentally that at some point tonight I'm going to go to bed, and I believe that the sun's going to rise tomorrow, and so I prepare myself that mentally I'm going to have another day tomorrow that I need to get up and face. Your belief changes how you act. Don't flip it around and make your actions the first or most important thing. The author of Ecclesiastes tells us there is, there is hope in all seasons of your life. I don't know what season you're in right now. I know for some of us, this, this may be the best time that you've had in the last 20 years. My parents were here a couple Sundays ago. And man, my dad is loving life. Retirement fits my dad perfectly. He is just having the, the time of his life, being able to have time uh, to himself, to his wife, to, to, to just doodling around the house and doing whatever. He loves it. Serving the, in the church that he's at, active there. Right, it's the best, best time of his life, probably because there's no kids around too. Right? That might be a plus for my dad in that process. We weren't the easiest ones right, uh, on earth. But, but for others of y'all, it's, it's a rough season. It's funeral after funeral after funeral. It's financial crisis after financial crisis. It's difficult conversation after difficult conversation. It's troubled marriages right, or strained relationships with children or grandchildren or whatever. Right? We've been there. We've seen it. I want you to know that that season that you're in right now doesn't have to last forever. In areas that you can act and bring reconciliation to broken relationships, you should. 
But while you're in those seasons, try to find the place that God has called you to joy and service for him. Because you have toil that's before you today. Serve for God in the toil that's before you. Let's pray.